The only thing comparable to seeing a champion win is the thrill of owning or training a winner, or perhaps turning a non-winner into a winner. Legendary trainer Ned Bryant gives his thoughts on training stayers and winners. Well, Ned, how do you normally go about training a stayer? Well, for a start, you can't pick a stayer on looks. You've got to try them. Well, we've got the facilities to try them. Uh, they go 5'11", they're a bit, uh, not quite good enough to be uh, top class. You can take them, put them over 600. And uh, if they're going all right there and you want to step to the 732, you, well, you, you can go up to 700, from 600 to 700, 732. And you can only go on the way they perform. Now, a little thing comes to mind. I was at trial track once and I saw a, a very good friend of mine trial a dog. And it was quite slow. And just as a joke, I says to him, you'll ruin that dog, throw it in my car. Well, he thought, here's my chance. He threw it in the car and away he went. Well, the dog's name, uh, Rod Deacon it was, the best trainer in the business at that time. The name of the dog was Supplier. And I tried it and I thought, oh, what have I got here? I had to take it back to him, it's too slow. So I did that, I put her up a bit further distance, a bit further distance, well, eventually, she broke the track record at Olympic Park over 7.32. But nobody knew that she could stay because she could, couldn't sprint. But the only way to find out is, is to do that. The only difference between training a stayer and a sprinter is a sprinter will go from week to week without a run. A stayer won't. You must give it a hand slip or a free gallop in the paddock halfway through the week to open its wind and, you know. But that's the only way you can pick them. But I do believe a lot of people think a stayer's got to be a lot lighter. I go the other way. I think he's got to be a bit heavier because he's got more stamina. The lighter you get them, the less stamina. The heavier you get, not on a team, fat, but a little bit heavier. They've got a much more, more stamina. Most of your stayers that you've had your success with were trained in that method, the extra run during the week. That's the only way you could do the it, yes. Way. And do you work out a program for your stayers? Uh, I work out a program for every dog I've got. I set them for a certain race. And if they win that, I can just go on from there without a program. But I always set my dogs for a certain race. And I started that program about six weeks before the actual race. And, and one day, if I've got time, I'll, you've got to have a pencil and paper, and I'll show you how, how I do it. Like, um, the big races I've won, I've always set them for it, for uh, quite some weeks before it happened. And that way, you knew exactly what you were doing. It's no good to say, and I'll enter him for the Melbourne Cup. Now, what'll I do next? You've got to know what you're doing next. And um, that's the only way, I think, to have success. And, and with your stayers, when you give them that extra run during the, the week, is there any set distance that you'd run them over? Or? No, the perfect way to do it is to get into a, a paddock and let them go. But most people haven't got a paddock. They've got to go somewhere and give them a hand slip about 300 yards. It's perfect. But, of course, then you've got to bring them home and check their feet and everything else uh, because they're racing in three days time or four days time so you, you gradually build the greyhound up in the distance that races over exactly hand yes. slipping what every fourth day or something That's like right. this i personally think there's a lot of strayers that people don't want because they've never tried them they're too slow for slow for sprint races they're probably champion stayers but if my dogs are not measuring up to invitation class i want to find out if they can stay and that way i found a lot of good stayers like Irish Tempest, Tesoro Mio, Supplier, all those, I didn't know they could stay. But they weren't quite up to scratch as sprinters. And did it take long for the, for the ability to stay to, to show to you or? No, about, um, about the second or third run you knew. And do you find that after a couple of runs they go a bit flat or do they normally keep improving? Or? Well, they'll keep improving. You, you've got to stop them from going flat. That's very important. Observation. It's a very important about, thing about greyhound training. And you look at your dog, you think about it, like you, you haven't got your mind on anything else. Observation, you know where they're going a bit flat. Next morning when you're walking, the morning after, you're looking and thinking, talking to yourself. Uh, you can see how a dog is going. Uh, well, even when I had dogs on the walking machine, they'd be going around and around and I'd be sitting watching the dogs. And I said, that fellow's a bit flat. Well, that one wants a little bit more work now. That only comes with, um, with time. I don't expect the average new trainer to do it, but it won't be long before he will. He'll, he'll soon work it out for himself. Did you use the walking machine every day? 
Every day, yes. Uh, well, son, no, I'm sorry. They had a day off a week. Sunday they didn't walk at all. But they were out in about half an acre paddock to run around. I'd take them out of a morning. Now, punctuality is a very important thing. Walk at exactly the same time. Feed at exactly the same time. Let them out for wet at exactly the same time. They're, an, uh, they're a creature of habit, and that's very important. The only three things to worry about with dogs is dedication, punctuality, and um, observation. If you, you stick to that, you'll get plenty of winners. So they, they needn't be frightened to use a walking machine or give their greyhound plenty of walking if they haven't got a machine. I'm not overwrapped in built walking machines. I've tried them, but I think it alters their gait, their natural gait. But with a circular walking machine, they can walk to their own gait. Do you understand what I mean? If you're walking along a road with a collar and lead, and the dog, and he can walk the way he wants to walk. But put him on a belt machine, it could alter that stride. He's got to do what the machine says. But a circular walking machine is the answer. You can put him on, take him off when you like, and leave the others there. And if you've got one getting him ready for a distance race, you can leave him there another five minutes and all that sort of thing. So plenty of walking doesn't hurt the grey hand. Well, too much walking does. It makes them tired. It's like if you lived in, um, in Melbourne and you worked in Footscray and you walked there every morning and home every night, it wouldn't be long before you wouldn't be doing much work. That's the same thing. You can walk them tired. And, uh, well, they feel tired. They look tired. What would be uh, the average distance you'd walk a stayer each morning? Well, I, I used to go on time, about 40 minutes. 40 minutes. At night time was just relaxation period. They only went out for a wet and a scratch around, you know, out for about 10 or 15 minutes. I think you've got to work a dog very hard to get him fit for about six or eight weeks. But after that, you come back and slow right down. It's amazing the tired dogs that are racing. Just too tired to care less. Is it hard to freshen the greyhound up if he goes a bit tired on you? No. Can I tell another little story that's just happened? I was checking a dog for this lady and uh, she said, why don't you tell me how to win a race? I said, you wouldn't listen to me. She said, I would. I said, no, you wouldn't. We had a bit of an argument. She says, well, how will I win a race next Saturday night at Cranbourne with this dog? Well, I said, I'll tell you, it, but you won't do it. She said, I will. I said, all right, from now till next, this was on the Sunday morning. I said, take him out and walk him 100 yards till he's empty, put him back in the kennel. Take him out for wet at lunchtime, back in the kennel. At night time, walk him 50 yards till he empties, back in the kennel. 11 o'clock at night, take him out for wet. And don't change your feed. And she says, when do I gallop him? I said, you don't. She said, your dog won't be fit. I said, I've just told you that you won't listen to me. I said, how long since you won a race? She said, 12 months. I said, well, another week won't matter. Another loss won't matter. I said, please do it. I met her after she kenneled her. I said, did you do everything I said? She said, exactly. So I went and backed him at 7 to 1. Home he got, led all the way. <laughs> you see, he was tired. I could see the dog was tired. He felt tired. So observation's an extremely important, very important thing for the trainer. Don't worry about the pretty girl walking up the street. Watch your dog. And talk to them too. They love it. And you always check your greyhounds the day after race. Always. Get now, it's out. very, very simple to do, even for the novice trainer. Make sure the greyhound's checked by yourself after the day of the race. By the trainer himself. Yeah, and and if he finds real trouble, he can always go to the vet or someone and say, now, what do I do about this, or can you fix this? And with now, the... now, they can ask anybody. that uh, They will help them. They can ask the top men. Don't ask mugs. Now, I myself, I don't care who it is. If he comes and asks me something, I'll put him on the right tram. And I love them to do it because the sport's got to go on. With Hydra Bath too, uh, Ned, never Hydro prior to a race, always no, no, after No, because they do tighten up a whisper. Uh, to be on the safe side, Hydro him next day, take all the tightness and soreness out of it. You saw how that dog shook himself and thought, oh, I feel good. Well, he doesn't have to be touched now, and he'll be racing next week. So you wouldn't want a hydro, certainly, if they were in the position where they were forced to hydro, you wouldn't want a hydro within three days of a race. Well, no, but they're not forced to hydro. Why would they? They can get a, a rag and a bit of warm water and clean him up, to clean a bit of mud and dirt off him if they want to, but not a hydro. So it's important that you stick to a regular diet. Well, it is, yeah. To, to keep your weight at a consistent level. Well, for five nights a week, 
you, you feed meat and kibble and the normal, and don't put too much rubbish in. No vitamins in that, they're, they're bad. And once a week you've got to feed a stew, and once a week you've got to feed bread and milk and molasses. That's what you need. You can't keep it up feeding bread and, uh, I mean, meat and kibble seven days a week. It's like you're eating steak and eggs. You love it, but you try eating it for a week and see what happens. You say, I don't want this. So it doesn't hurt to vary the diet at all. You've got to vary it, and even the, the taste. Uh, I used to vary the taste of my... I, tonight I'd put a bit of honey with it. Next night I'd put a bit of treacle with it. The next night I'd put a bit of Vegemite with it. A different thing every night, you know. Vary the taste. Yeah, you've got, to, you've got to vary it. Would you always get your meat at the one supplier? Always, yeah. And, and you, you've got to buy good meat, especially with a bit of fat, uh, preferably with a bit of fat in it. People use very, they think the meat's got to be very lean. It hasn't. They've got to have a little bit of fat in it. 10 or 15% fat, even 20% fat. Because there's, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of goodness in the fat, you know. Lean meat's not much good at all. There are many fine points that can improve your greyhound's performance. For example, keep your water and feed bowls up off the ground to save extra pressure on shoulders when feeding or drinking. And here is a tip on muzzles. You must raise a dog in a muzzle. It's a very important part of a dog, the muzzle. Now, a dog's got to gallop with his mouth open, wide open, to get to breathe. Now, this muzzle is shallow. The mouth can open that wide no further. Now, if you had a, a muzzle that was deep, see how shallow that is? If you had a deep muzzle, the dog would be able to open so it should go there. Now, see the difference? Now, with a tight muzzle, the dog is likely to fight. It goes to the next dog and rubs its head up and trying to get relief, or it can't open its mouth wide enough to get a full gallop. You understand? Very important thing. The muzzle. And they've got to be out past there because if they're close, see what happens, it rubs up and down in there. So it's got to be at least an inch past there. Promising young trainer Darren McDonald now receives some hints on greyhound care. But the dogs love it, they don't mind, he's relaxed there. And you can see what's happening. Hey Jack. Good boy. Right here. They're very placid things, greyhounds. They don't mind you repairing them, fixing their injuries. As you can see that, they love it. Well, the reason these muzzles on is because, not because they're savage or anything like that, you can do anything with them. But you don't want them walking around picking up something you don't want them to eat because they will grab anything and eat it. But that's the only reason the muzzle's on. They're the most placid dog in the world. You can do anything with them. He even wanted to eat my hand, so you see, wouldn't want him doing that, would you? <laughs> also, while they're laying on the table, you can check their ears to see if there's any dirt in The best way is to get a cotton bud, dip it in metho, squeeze it out and clean out their ears. Now, another thing about a greyhound's ears, his hearing is 40 times more sensitive than a human's ears. So a lot of people, when they're going to the races, they're in the saddle and paddock, and they're going like that, you beauty. Well, it sets up a bell ringing action, and when he gets in the boxes, he can't hear the lure coming. He'll miss the kick because of this. If you must patch it up, fiddle around with him like that. But none of this, especially if, uh, just prior to a race. <laughs> to keep him nice and clean everywhere, especially this department here. If he gets a discharge, which he will do, he turns around, licks it when he's in his bed, and it's like having a bad tooth. It'll make him crook in the tummy. So what you've got to do, you've got to get a bit of hibertine solution with warm water and wash him out just like this. And you've got to do that at least once a week. And another thing is his anal gland. It's got to be cleaned out at least once a week to keep him in good condition. So this one's quite good. But the way you do that is about every fortnight give him a shin bone. He chews it and these finish up beautiful and white. Well, it's very important with a greyhound, his toenails. Now, this dog's toenails are all the same. Now, this one should be fairly short, this one a bit longer, this one a bit longer, and this one the longest, for the break of the feet when he's cornering. He wants to put the weight on the four toes, but if you've got him like this, he's putting the weight on those two toes and very little with that one. Do you understand that? 
Now, if you file the nails that way, when he puts his feet and takes the corner, they're all getting the same pressure. Very important. Now, always before you hydro your dog, you get a bit of cotton wool and poke it into his ears like that. So it's when you're hydroing your dog and the water don't get in his ears, otherwise you get canker. And uh, you've seen dogs running around shaking their heads, well, they've got a touch of canker. Well, that stops the water from going in. But when you're finished dry him, always take it out. If you can get it. Otherwise, you wouldn't want him going to a racetrack with cotton wool in his ears and not hearing the lure, would you? Well, Tony's hydrating a dog at race last night. As you can see, he's nice and gentle with it. And uh, what that does relaxes the dog, relaxes all the muscles and takes 90% uh, of the so running soreness out of them. And as you see, the dog loves it. He, he just stands there and takes everything. And uh, one of the best things to put in a hydro bath is Martha's Gardener's wool mix. It'll keep the fleas away, the flake, keep the flies away. The coat will finish up nice and glossy and it'll get rid of dandruff. Uh, it's no good of putting things in like penetrine or that because it, the dog breathes it into his lungs and he's got no pores in his skin and it's not, not doing the dog a lot of good. But what Tony's doing now, you can see he's done it before, he's doing a marvellous job. When he dries the dog off, it'll be just like you having a good hot shower. Beautiful. If he had a white dog, and he put a little bit of blue in the water, like uh, women use for white clothes. The white dog will come out snow white. Makes an enormous difference. But it doesn't make a difference to that coloured dog. You can see that rippling the muscles as he's going up and down there. They're the muscles he used last night, getting around the corner, and he loves it. It settled him right down. He's just drying him off now, and the dog will get great benefit. What he does now, he takes him out, he gets a couple of towels, dries him right off. The dog will have a good shake. He put him back in his nice, cosy bed, and then sleep like a, like a baby till tea time. In the winter time, when it's cold, you dry them off like this, but then when you finish, you run over with the hairdryer to make sure there's no dampness because uh, they'll catch a cold pretty quick and get a bit of tonsillitis. You got to look, they're champions. They got to be, uh, they're um, highly, highly sophisticated running machines and you got to treat them as such. Next day after race, watch this very carefully. First check his eyes to see there's no trouble. Have a look down here, no broken teeth. Looks all right there, give him a bit of push around the neck. No problems. No problems there. Now that's simple enough. <clears throat> and you can do this yourself, easy. <clears throat> Have a look, see if any toe damage. No toe damage. No um, sand toes. Just a little bit of pressure around the metacarpals there. No damage there. Wrist is okay. That's all right. No soreness on the shoulder. See a little bit of pressure. Check that muscle. That's very simple. Same with this side, exactly. A little bit of pressure. No wrist trouble. No shoulder trouble. No soreness. Just try his neck again. Beautiful. Now your little, your little daughter can do that. <clears throat> Run along his back, around the muscles there. If there's a tear, you'll feel it. A little bit of pressure there, not much. Turn around. No tears. No soreness. Run down the sartorial muscle. No soreness. Pretty simple. Check the Achilles tendon, toes, hock. Working good. No trouble. 
Do the same on this side. Same as the other side. No trouble. You've just saved yourself 10 or $20. No trouble. And now to conclude, whilst not everyone can build a kennel block to this standard, we can all maintain a high standard of cleanliness and hygiene and try to avoid disease breakout and control pests as well as ensuring a healthy racing environment.